all that fantastic linkage with the local community, which has so many benefits in both directions. So I'm, I'm really overawed by what uh, Sam and Lee have accomplished with, and all their colleagues have accomplished here. But the ABI has been taking full advantage of the facilities here, as you've heard many talks um, from people from ABI, from Auckland Bioengineering Institute. But I wanted to talk particularly about um, the digital twin um, concept and where we're taking it, because it is a, a bit of a change of direction for the ABI, and I think it's, it's a change of direction that will be, um, is going to require the sort of resources that uh, Matai has, and I think it's going to be extremely important that we continue to develop those close collaborations, in fact, even more collaboration as we go into this process of thinking about the body as a, a highly integrated system. I'm going to talk um, about th uh, three grants, mainly about two of them that have recently started, or, or one has recently started and one a little while ago, and then a new one that's, so, so we have, we've got funding from the, from MB, Ministry of Business, Innovation, Employment, um, around, and it's a catalyst grant that was deliberately targeting international collaborations around the idea of building digital human twins. And for a number of years, we've had a, an NIH funded Spark project, which has created quite a bit of infrastructure that I'll talk about that we're making use of in the MB 12 Labours project. Um, and then recently we've got another NIH project that I'll talk very briefly about called TARA, which is about uh, acupuncture. But the, um, for us, the MB project has allowed us to build an infrastructure that um, we've now managed to get a Horizon Europe funding. New Zealand recently joined Horizon Europe so that they can tap into the, the very large funding available and we can apply as if we were a European country. So we did and we got a, a grant which we've called VITAL. So I'll talk a little bit about um, the infrastructure that we developed through 12 Labours and Spark is really going to support our efforts in that um, this new European project that kicks off next year, um, beginning of next year. So one thing I wanted to emphasise, and it's very much what I've seen here at uh, MATI as well, is that you make we make very little distinction between our academic members of our institute, ABI, and our professional staff who enable us to achieve the academic outcomes. And I, I think that's really vital, that you have that close integration between people of extremely diverse abilities to successfully undertake um, particularly translational research projects. So I just want to talk about a couple of those groups at the ABI who've helped create the infrastructure that allows us to do the science that we um, do. So one of them is the group here led by um, David Nixon, Andre, we, we call him, and it's about building infrastructure around standards for modeling as we deal with very, very complex models in the human body. It's really important that we have standards that we can encode those models to make sure that they're reproducible. So Andre's led that work and we have um, a database, and, and you, what you see there at the top is Tommy Yu, who looks after that database. Open source, freely available software. Alan Garney there has developed that software for um, solving the models that come from that database. And then we've recently launched a journal called Physiome, um, and Karen Lundegaard is looking after that, and that's um, allowing us to get, or modelers to get citation credit for these reproducible uh, models. So a lot of our infrastructure at the molecular end of the spectrum depends on the work that these people do. And then that repository of models um, has 1,500 models from people all around the world who um, create the models that go into the um, Physiome database, covering all aspects of biology. But what we've begun to realise is that um, while we can make these models reproducible, we really need to also make sure that they obey the laws of physics. So we're redoing a lot of these based on understanding some of the very sim relatively simple physical principles that underpin all of biological function. And the, um, there's 20,000 genes in the human genome that code for proteins, and 
if you look at the numbers of types of class of protein, there's probably only around 100 different really major classes of protein. And in each of those classes, we're beginning to think about what are the, the core physics mechanisms that underpin the function of those proteins. Can we capture the, the basic physics of those processes in um, models that then we can then parameterize, we can find that by fitting to data or fitting to molecular modeling of those proteins, we can capture the key essence of the function of those proteins. And for example, one of the families that we've been working with recently um, is the family of solute-linked transporters, S SLC transporters. There's about 500 genes organized into 66 families. And these are the little guys that sit in the membranes of your cells that transport um, all sorts of substances across those membranes. And there's only, it's 500 genes, 66 families for all the different types of, I mean, one of them is, is glucose, for example, that you transport across the cell membrane. Um, but all the metals too, all, all the things like zinc, et cetera, that your body needs. Um, but what we found is that you only need four basic templates of, of models that provide the templates to capture all 500 genes. So what, once you discover the, the key physics of those families of proteins, the complexity of biology becomes, I think, much, much simpler because you're, you're basically capturing the underlying physics of all of those processes. Um, then another, as you move up from the molecular to the uh, cell scale, and above the cellular scale particularly, um, you reach a point where the 3D organization of cells really matters. Um, and so you have to think about spatial structure, just as you do in the engineering world when you design any engineering component, you're thinking about not only the material properties of that um, component, but you're also thinking about the shape of it. So biology has a very wide range of shapes. They never look like engineering shapes. They never, never have sharp corners. They're always much smoother. So what um, the software team at ABI, led by um, Richard Christie and Hugh Sorby, have been doing is essentially building a CAD system. That's a computer-aided design system for anatomy. And that is the ability to create modules that capture the topology, spatial um, arrangements, the geometry of parts of the body, all the way from, from things that happen at the level of, of cells up to whole organs and then the whole body. So we're, we're really reusing a lot of these fundamental um, structures as we build these larger scale models. So we're very dependent on the skills that these professional staff software programmers in this case have to give us the tools we need to do the science. Um, and then one of the ways we're using those scaffolds is this project I mentioned called Spark, which is about um, mapping the autonomic system of the body. And that's looking at how you map the autonomic control, the nervous control from the brainstem that controls and interacts with all the visceral organs of the body. Um, and so we use the, the scaffolds to map that connectivity of nerves from the brainstem into the organs. And then we also model the way that those various neural neurons are embedded in the organ. So there you're looking at, on the left, um, you're looking at building models of the colon based on looking at the center lines, looking at the Hellstra structure of the colon, and then on the left, this is top left, is a colon for a human, in the middle is the pig, and the next one is, is the mouse or the rat, and all three basically use that same concept of building um, a common, building a scaffold for the colon and understanding the function of the colon based on assembling these basic units. Same for the heart and the lungs, which you can see there. And then on the right, uh, to, uh, the middle one shows the neurons embedded in the heart. Um, and all that data is coming from experimentalists, where we then map their data onto that spatial description of those scaffolds. And of course, those are the scaffolds that you fit when you're doing MRI imaging. So we're able to then populate those MR-fitted scaffolds with data that tells you about the function of that organ, in this case, from neural innovation. And then on the right is the just mapping some of the um, blood vessels and neurons for the stomach. Um, then the other thing is you need to be able to step back from the details of one organ, like the heart or the lungs or the colon or, or whatever, and say the body is highly integrated. You know, there's 20,000 genes 
20 years ago, we thought there was one gene, one function. We now know that it's much closer to being that every gene affects every function. Every function depends on almost every gene. It's not quite true, but it's pretty close. So the body is so highly integrated that you can't think about any chronic disease without thinking about the interconnections between organs and the fact that they're being, being constantly monitored by the autonomic uh, or by the sensory nerves and then controlled to some extent by the autonomic nerves. So what we've built is an environment where essentially you have it's, it's like a Google map. So you can step back and look at the whole picture. Um, we call it a functional connectivity map. So each of those colored um, bits is, corresponds to an organ system, and there's 12 of them. That's why we call it the 12 Labors Project. And then within each organ system are all the organs, and with each, within each organ are the labels for each type of functional tissue unit that captures the key function that emerges from molecular and cell biology. Um, and then we can zoom in into that picture at any point and zoom right down to the, the level of an individual protein to be able to look at func multi-scale function. I mean, it's very far from being complete, but we've got the infrastructure now to be able to think about the body as a complete system, highly integrated. Multi-scale really matters. In the end, you've got to deal with protein function. Most medical diagnoses are made on the basis of blood biomarkers, so you have to get down to the protein level to often to properly diagnose and, and plan uh, treatment strategies for disease, as well as the imaging, of course. But So this environment is beginning to allow us to create an environment where we can zoom between the whole body at, right down to the protein level. Um, and one example of using that is we're using for this um, European project, VITAL it's called, is to say, let's look at all the blood vessels um, all the way down to the point at which they enter individual organs and, and all the muscles, and then build, as well as building the functional and anatomical maps, we can map it into three dimensions. It's all supplied by a common database. It's working with a, a group at UCSD for that database. So all the information that's displayed in these various forms is coming. We put all the information into one single um, knowledge base that allows us to map into all these different views. And then what you're looking at there is just mapping the, the blood vessels or uh, um, a number of generations of blood vessels out into the 3D body and being able to then solve the, the mathematical models associated with blood flow um, around the body and interrogate the the circulation at any point to, to see what the pressures and flows are doing under the particular boundary conditions for that individual. You know, the whole idea of a digital human twin is that uh, using scanning techniques, including MRI, you want to be able to adapt these models to suit the anatomy and as much as possible the physiology of um, a particular individual because everyone varies so much. So the 12 Labors project is building that infrastructure. That platform one there is what I've been talking about in terms of cell level, molecular cell level, and, and the, the design of spatial scaffolds. Platform two, which I'm not going to talk about, is the clinical workflows. And platform three is the medical devices that we want to feed into this holistic view of the body, including a lot of wearable implantable devices. And then the we're using three exemplar projects shown there, pulmonary hypertension being the first of those. And you'll hear more about um, from Marty today, for example, about the, the cardiac work um, that's feeding into this. Um, so these are all the people at ABI who are driving the various parts of the 12 Labors project. Merrin, is, who's the new director of ABI, is driving the, the lung respiratory work. Marty's driving the cardiac. Um, and so on, Tors doing the musculoskeletal, um, Prasad's doing the... And many of these people, Matt I know well because they're using, interacting with Matt I for imaging, um, Prasad's driving the clinical workflow um, platform, and so on. Um, so the goals of trial labours are to build this holistic view of the body across scales, across all organ systems, using physics at the bottom level and always trying to link it to data from an individual because the models are geared to an individual to see if we can improve 
um, strategies for healthcare through a, a more holistic physics-based approach, but always linking to data and particularly to wearable and plantable devices. So what, one of the, the spin-out companies from the ABI recently that's um, involved with 12 Labors is a company called Kaitia Health, which has been developing small pressure, um, very stable long-term pressure measurements, which are used inside the skull for looking at issues to do with hydrocephalus, but also as pulmonary stable pressure measurements in the pulmonary artery and potentially anywhere in the body for getting long-term stable pressure recordings where it's inductively powered so you don't need batteries with the device, it can stay there, it's powered by an external wand and you pick up signals through telemetry from the device. So those devices, we need to make sure we're coupling all these models, the different scales into those various devices and then building whole human models um, as shown here. So the idea is that each, each organ system gets built into this comprehensive picture of, of the body that can be then tailored to a given individual. Um, and then one of the aspects for the whole body is um, Alex, shown there, is developing a scanning system. Alex is, was down here last week or earlier this week, I think, being scanned, but also where we're trying to make sure that we can find ways of doing very rapid whole body external surface scanning, uh, very cheap and very dynamic, you know, high, operates at 30 hertz, can give us millimeter reso level resolution on skin surface so that you can quickly create a body um, for the individual and then into that body can be registered the various organs from MR imaging um, as shown on the right there. Um, this is just really highlighting one of the key parts of this whole thing is what we call functional tissue units. And that's the idea that if you start with molecular, cellular um, physiology or biology on the left, um, and then as you move to the right, you're building up towards whole organ and whole body, whole organ system physiology. But a key part of that is the ability, it's, it's where molecular and cell biology really meets physiology. And that's at this level of this functional tissue unit where 3D structure really matters. So it's a nephron in a kidney, it's a, an acinus in the lung, or alveoli in the lung, it's, and so on and so on. Each uh, osteon and bone, each, each type of material, each type of tissue has a particular functional tissue unit that captures the physiological function associated with the cells and molecular biology of that um, tissue. And then we, we, we have automated ways of then assembling those models up towards the whole organ. And then the reason, one of the reasons for doing this is that if you are looking at a chronic disease, you're looking at information from multiple scales. You're using, um, at the top level, using MRI imaging, um, for looking in on a, an organ, or you're using functional physiological function tests, lung function tests, for example, or cardiac tests, to look at physiological function at that whole scale. But then at the bottom level, you've, you've got to have models of the, the molecular and cellular processes because blood biomarkers are an important part of a diagnosis. Um, and genetics, of course, is increasingly being come, becoming part of that diagnosis. So the ability to really use genetics, blood or other fluid biomarkers for cells and tissues together with images and physiological function testing, putting that all together is where you really need these integrative models that deal with multi-scale issues. Um, and then finally, just a couple of slides on this pro new project that's kicking off shortly on the um, acupuncture. So the idea here is an NIH-funded project working with a group at Harvard and what they're interested in is just understanding how acupuncture works. Um, and so they're putting little experts are finding the, the acupoints, they call them, positions where the acupuncture needles go in and are effective. And then we map those points using the whole body imaging to be able to locate those points on a whole body model. And then look at the, look at the tissue structures under those points to understand how that perturbation from the acupuncture needle is perturbing either the fascia or the autonomic system or the blood vessels um, to achieve its therapeutic effect. And I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Thank you.